Hello, thank you for joining me today in our Bible study. Today we are in Romans chapter 9. Let me give you a little bit of background of Romans chapters 9 and 10. You know, Paul is going to great lengths describing how Israel was God's chosen people under the Old Covenant. Well, he also goes to great lengths to describe to us the sovereignty of God, the foreknowledge of God, the predestination of God, and the free will of man. Well, you put all of those together and sometimes it gets a little bit confusing, doesn't it? Do you ever have trouble balancing all of those together? If you do, raise your hand. I see those hands out there. Uh, I have to admit, I, I really have difficulty whenever I'm reading one passage of Scripture and it's talking about the predestination of God. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to balance that with what I know the Bible says about the free will of man. And then sometimes with the free will of man, uh, it's easy to overlook the predestination and the foreknowledge of God. But uh, Paul is going to great lengths in this passage of Scripture to help us to form an understanding of what he is teaching us here. And we need to remember that whenever Paul refers back to the Old Testament, he is making it very clear. Many of his readers were Gentile, but this book, uh, Romans, was sent to the church at Rome. It would have contained both Jewish and Gentile readers whenever he sent that letter to the church at Rome. Uh, let's get right into this. And, and, and see what Paul is saying. I want to jump ahead to uh, chapter 10 just for a second. And uh, we will deal with that in next week's lesson. But it comes from about the fourth or fifth sermon that I ever did. I preached Romans chapter 10. And it has been one of my favorite memory passages. In the King James Version, it goes something like this. Paul says, Brothers, my heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, and as a result, they've gone about to establish their own righteousness. So, now notice that. He said, I have a heart's desire for Israel. Well, in this passage of Scripture in chapter 9, he is making it clear to us that under the Old Covenant, Israel was still God's chosen people. Now let's back up and let's look at chapter 9 beginning in verse 1. He comes out boldly and he says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confers it in the Holy Spirit. So my conscience confirms that the Holy Spirit is moving through me as I am writing these letters of uh, these words of truth to you. So Paul is saying, I am completely convinced that the Holy Spirit has confirmed what I'm writing to you about. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Verse 3 says, I wish myself to be accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Now, notice that. Where have you heard that before? You know, uh, uh, Moses had made the statement in the book of Exodus. He said, Lord, you know, if you're going to uh, wipe out these people, your chosen people that you're establishing covenant with, then blot out my name also. Lord, if you're going to step back and because of your namesake, if you're going to wipe out all of these people and the promise that you made to, uh, to Abraham, wipe out my name also. And so here what Paul is talking about, he really didn't want to lose his life, but he is making it clear as to what his faith is. And he wishes, he said, even if it would mean the end of my physical life, I would give up my life if God's people 
could understand and come to Christ. You know, uh, he, he had seen many people of his day rejecting the fulfillment of the Old Covenant, which was in Jesus Christ. Uh, he says uh, in verse 4, theirs is the adoption as, son, as sons. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. So Paul was saying, look, under the old covenant, look at all of the things that God has provided to prove that Israel was his chosen people. He says, theirs are the patriarchs. So in other words, among the children of Israel, there are the patriarchs, and found in them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So again, where did the covenant begin? The covenant began with Abraham. So uh, it was that, that was the beginning of the Hebrew nation or the Israelite nation. And we know that 42 generations later, Jesus Christ was born. Jesus Christ was born to Joseph and to Mary. Now, there were a lot of difficult things that happened along the way. We know that God delivered the law, but yet he even threatened to wipe out all of the Israelite nation and start all over with Moses and his family. But notice verse 5. He says, it's not as though God's word had failed, for not all who descended from Israel are Israel. Now, notice this. He's doing a play on words here to tie in the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. So he is saying, not everyone who descended from Israel has accepted the fulfillment of God's covenant in Jesus Christ. So he says, uh, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Reje uh, Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Well, did God really hate Esau? No, he did not. But what we need to understand in this uh, passage of Scripture, he is saying, I went against the tradition of the Hebrews, and I chose Jacob. I chose the younger one to fulfill my purposes. So God can make any choices that he wants to fulfill his purposes. Now, I said in earlier lessons that predestination, as, as far as you are concerned, is that God has predetermined what steps you should take in your life. And he's given you the free will to make that final choice. So here we see, though, that God goes on to, I mean, that God's word goes on to say in Romans 9, a little bit later on, that salvation is of faith, not by works. So, now notice this. In God's sovereignty and in his predestination, he set a plan in order. And if Israel if everybody in Israel could be saved, it would be a salvation of works. All they had to do was carry out every single step along the way, dot all of the I's, cross all the T's, and they would be saved. But he said, not everybody who is from Israel is really Israel. And he is tying in the fact that there has to be faith. There has to be a response by faith. 
And that is really, under the New Covenant, God's chosen people. God chose a lineage in the Old Testament. And that lineage went all the way from Abraham to Jesus Christ. And then that was fulfilled. The covenant was fulfilled in Jesus. God had told Abraham that through his seed, one day there would be someone who would come forward, and through his seed, all nations of the world would be blessed. And so I want to remind you that Jesus himself said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So I also want to remind you that the scripture says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, whoever believes on him would be saved. They would have eternal life. Scripture goes on to say, God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So that invitation for salvation was given to every man, woman, boy, and girl. But God has a different calling for you and a different calling for me. But under the Old Covenant, Whenever it says, I will show mercy unto whom I will show mercy, you know, there was a, uh, uh, because of God's blessing on somebody's life, there were things that would accompany that blessing. And so, uh, uh, notice in verse 16, it says, It does not depend upon man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Now, I want you to notice this. Uh, I've really been reading a lot in the book of Exodus lately, and, uh, and I, I, I really like this thought, and, and I just want you to think deeply about this thought. Doesn't it seem that in the story of Moses and Pharaoh, that whenever it says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, doesn't it seem as if God has predestined Pharaoh for damnation, doesn't it? I want you to notice something about this. If Pharaoh was predestined for damnation, wouldn't that mean that for Pharaoh did not have a free will? Now, as you let that marinate in your mind a little bit, let me read the scripture in verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on who he wants to have mercy, and he hardens who he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who resists his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to he who formed it, Why did you make me like this? All right, so how do we get this balance? How do we get this balance between the predestination of God and the free will of man? Well, I, I think it's in understanding the foreknowledge of God. I think that we get this understanding about his predestination by understanding the foreknowledge of God. So, Moses was a part of God's creation, right? And so, Moses, God made a calling to Moses. I, uh, I'm going to preach about that uh, at, at the time that you're listening to that. I will have preached about it last Sunday. And I will be preaching about it again on July the 4th. But, uh, but think about this. He called Moses. God, in his foreknowledge, he knew about his plan. And uh, he had a knowledge that Moses would respond to his calling. God says to Moses, I'm about to harden Pharaoh's now, think about it this way. God created Pharaoh as well. And he knew the nature of Pharaoh. 
he knew that Pharaoh, in his free will, he didn't want God. He didn't want to serve God. In his spirit, he did not want to serve God. And every time God would go to Pharaoh, send Moses to Pharaoh, and God would send a plague, it would harden Pharaoh's heart that much again against God. And again, God would say, I'm going to go harden his heart again. Think about it this way. Years ago, there was a man whenever I was pastoring in Missouri, and I got him to start coming to our worship services, and it was through inviting his children to Vacation Bible School. He was a single father whose wife had left him and his kids. The man was a terrible alcoholic, but uh, there was a sense of conviction uh, in the man. He wanted his children to understand God and find God. But whenever I witnessed to this man, he would always say, I'm not ready to meet God. And it took me a while to understand that every time he would tell me I'm not ready to meet God, he was saying, I'm not ready to give up my lifestyle. I'm not ready to quit uh, getting drunk and drinking all the time. I'm not ready to do this. If I were to meet God, I would have to give all of this up. And I noticed that every time I witnessed to him, he actually drew further and further and further and further away. He hardened his heart. Now, God was dealing with Pharaoh, and the scripture makes it clear in the book of Exodus. He was trying to get Pharaoh to repent or change. But God knew Pharaoh's nature. It would have been just as easy to have said that Pharaoh hardened his own heart by rejecting the call of God to repent. God would send a message, you repent and let my people go. And every time Pharaoh said no, his heart would harden further. You see, there wasn't a repentant bone in Pharaoh's body. And with every plague that came, his heart got a little harder. Every time that God dealt with his heart to repent, and every time he said no, his heart got a little harder. So yes, God hardened his heart by dealing with him. But Pharaoh hardened his own heart too by saying no to God. Wow. So, in verse 19, it then says, One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? So, so the point that Paul is making here is, if everything is predestined, where is the free will of man? And I think to some degree we've just explained that. If everything is predestined to the point that, that it happens without the say of our free will, then who can resist his will? You see, there has to be a balance in there, and that balance comes through the foreknowledge of God. God knew that Pharaoh would say no. God knew that Pharaoh would say no. And we need to remember that God is the potter. We are the clay. He formed us and gave us the opportunity to obey him. But we do still have that choice. Now, in verse 23 it says, What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. A lot of you know the story of uh, Hosea and his wife Gomer. Uh, God, uh, God told Hosea 
he said, I want you to go down and take a wife of whoredoms. Now, I really think that uh, whenever you read that passage of Scripture, uh, Hosea, I personally do not believe that Hosea knew that his wife would become a prostitute or that she had been a prostitute uh, at the shrines of the idols. But, uh, but anyway, whenever she married Hosea, she began to long for her past. And uh, through her children, the first child that they had together, Hosea knew that that was his child. The second child that they had, or that Gomer had, uh, Hosea gave the child an odd name because it was as if he was saying, I, I don't know if this is my child or not. And then the third child was given a name that translated means, this is not my baby. This is not my child. And the reason Hosea was called to be a prophet of God he wanted to uh, show God's mercy through the life of Hosea. After Hosea found out that his wife was a prostitute, that she had gone back to her own way of life, sometime later, Hosea saw his wife. She had been used up. She was at the slave market being sold as a slave. And Hosea went and got some money and went and bought back his wife and he said to her he said you are my wife again and you will never leave my house you'll never leave my sight well that was a picture 800 years before Jesus was born that was a picture of Jesus we were unfaithful to God Israel was unfaithful to God but God still loved Israel and he sent his son Jesus to pay the price and buy back Israel because he wanted a relationship with anyone who would receive his son by faith. And that same invitation is extended to you and I. He goes on to say in verse 26, And it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they shall be called the children of the living God. So you see, God is very, very interested in us. The scripture says, teaches us that a remnant will be saved, that the Lord will carry out his will with finality. And, and it goes on. So finally, in verse 30, it says, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who originally did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it, a righteousness that's by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So, I want you to notice this last thought before I close today. Again, it goes on to say that salvation is never, ever, ever by works. Paul would write to the church at Ephesus, For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's not of works. There's no reason for us to brag about it. And, and then James, Jesus' brother, said, uh, he teaches us that faith without works is dead. But again, he teaches us at the same moment that our faith, our, our works, are the result of our faith. The works do not save us. The works are the result of our faith. We are saved by faith. And so, uh, in closing, what he is teaching the uh, children of Israel here, what he is teaching the Jewish followers, that uh, the old covenant has been fulfilled, and there is a new covenant, a covenant where we receive God's Son, the fulfillment of the covenant. We receive him by faith and enter in to a new covenant where we accept by faith 
the shed blood of Jesus Christ for every sin we ever committed. Thank you so much for being a part of this Bible study. I hope it has blessed you in some way. God bless you.